Colorado Supreme Court's decision to ban him from the state's 2024 presidential ballot, Michael Kastner reports. Colorado Supreme Court said on Tuesday he violated the 14th Amendment's insurrectionist ban on January 6, 2021, when he encouraged the violent demonstrations at the U.S. Capitol. Most of Gaza's population has been displaced as the Israel-Hamas war rages on. The political leader of Hamas is in Cairo today to talk with Egyptian leaders about the Israeli hostages and a possible ceasefire. Last night, the U.N. Security Council failed to agree on a ceasefire resolution that wouldn't be vetoed by the U.S. and the body is scheduled to meet again today. A vote on President Biden's request for Ukraine aid will have to wait until 2024. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre told reporters today Congress needs to act swiftly in January. The administration says the U.S. will run out of resources for Ukraine at the end of the month. Republicans are demanding border policy changes be part of any deal for additional Ukraine aid. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said the country's military leadership has proposed to mobilize an additional 500,000 people. Megumi Lim reports from Kyiv. The Ukrainian leader has called mobilization a highly sensitive issue and that the proposal will be discussed before parliament considers it. He added that the military had to also address the issue of rotation and demobilizing soldiers. The number of Ukraine's troops are not publicized and the number of losses are also kept secret. But U.S. officials estimate that hundreds of thousands of troops on both Ukrainian and Russian sides have been killed or wounded. There appears to be a link between paying unaffordable rent and dying sooner. A study out of Princeton University found that people who paid 50 percent of their income on rent were 9 percent more likely to die over the next 20 years than people who paid 30 percent toward rent. Researchers said unaffordable rent causes people to cut back on other essential spending like food, medicine, and doctor's visits, which can impact health outcomes. You're listening to the latest on NBC News Radio. It's a bird! It's a plane! No, it's Super Super Roth. Roth! Okay, a gimmicky opening for a commercial about Super Roth Universal Life Insurance, but I'm sure it got your attention. Now, what is a Super Roth, you ask? It's a permanent indexed universal life insurance that's totally liquid and easily accessible once it matures, can be used to supplement retirement savings or a death benefit, or both, has no income or contribution limit, has no five-year rule like Roth IRAs, has no 10% penalty for accessing the funds before age 59 and a half. Oh, and the average historical returns are 5 to 7% annually, tax-free. Super Roths also lock in gains, which means you don't lose your money when the market is down. Sounds incredible, right? Sounds super? Super Roths are the way of the future, specifically your future. To see if you qualify for a Super Roth, go online to thesuperroth.com. Hi, I'm food critic Alan Morgan, and I'm excited to tell you about Raid Shanghai Bistro, located next to Redlands DMV on Magonia in Redlands. Ray Shanghai Bistro offers the largest and most delicious array of traditional and original Chinese dishes available in the Inland Empire. Some of my favorite dishes are the house-made pot stickers, the crisp pork spare ribs with garlic, their unique spicy lamb with bamboo, the sweet and tangy deep-fried orange peel beef, mm-mm, and the savory basil spicy shrimp, plus lots of vegetarian dishes. Whether you dine in, pick up the food, or have them cater your next party or special occasions, you will see why Ray, spelled R-U-I apostrophe S, Shanghai Bistro, is truly the best Chinese restaurant in the Yulin Empire. Their website is raisshanghaibistro.net. That's raisshanghaibistro.net. R-U-I-S, shanghaibistro.net. Happy eating. You won't be disappointed. For over a century, AM radio has evolved to meet the needs of our community. More than 80 million listeners depend on AM radio each month. It's also the backbone of the emergency alert system, keeping us safe in dangerous times. A new bill in Congress would ensure this free, reliable service remains in cars. Text AM to 52886 and tell Congress to support the AM radio for every vehicle act. Message and data rates may apply. You may receive up to four messages a month, and you may text STOP to STOP. This message furnished by the National Association of Broadcasters. It's that time of year again. No, not the holidays. Medicare open enrollment. And if you have questions about Medicare, you should talk to the local experts, Paul Barrich and Associates. Paul and his agents are certified with plans that are accepted by most of the medical groups in our area. Call 909-793-0385. Their service is free, and after 42 years in the business, their agents are trained to help you pick the plan that's right for you. This is KCAA. Thank you.
Welcome to the Worker Power Hour with Randy Corrigan, a brand new show about labor and worker issues. The host of the show is Randy Corrigan, Secretary, Treasurer, and Principal Office and Leader of Teamsters 1932, one of the largest public sector labor unions on the West Coast, representing workers in government and non-sworn law enforcement personnel. Randy Corrigan is a 30-year Teamster who first became involved in the labor movement by volunteering his time as an organizer with the Teamsters Union at the age of 21. Since then, he's helped thousands organize, mobilize, and achieve bargaining rights. He accomplished this by spending countless hours with brave men and women all over Southern California, in their living rooms, on the picket line, to bring workers towards victory. This is the Worker Power Hour. And now here's the host of the show, Randy Corrigan. You're listening to KCAA 1050 AM and 106.5 FM. It's the Worker Power Hour. Uh, we have a great show today. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Um, we want to make sure that you you get to hear from a great guest we have on today. Uh, we will be, uh, my mentor is actually here, uh, somebody uh, by the name of Randy Kamek, who I've known almost my entire adult life. Uh, we'll be hearing from him in about 10 or 15 minutes uh, after we get through all the other stuff, but he's sitting side saddle uh, right next to me, uh, getting to listen in. A very proud moment for me. Uh, but uh, let's get let's get to the first parts of the show. Uh, thanks for listening, and uh, Randy, thanks for being here. Uh, we'll hear, like I said, we'll hear from him him in a few minutes. So, uh, the beginning of our show, we always like to kind of recap what happened last week. And uh, a recap of last week's show, we had Jennifer and Steve Kramer from Batter Rebellion. Uh, what a great couple guests they were! Teamster Advantage partner that came in, got on the show, and talked about all of. Uh, the great things that they're doing in our partnership. Uh, I, I, I was particularly, I, I like their, their Sunday brunch with the wide array of different types of mimosas right. that they said they have. Um, hey, Romaldo, Frank, was there anything in which you two stuck out to you in that interview? I thought it was a great interview. Oh, absolutely. Frank, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I thought just the pure concept of a batter-based uh, restaurant with like a theme of the food, you know, being based around something to do with batter. I thought that was, I thought that was super clever. Um, I'm looking forward to going over there after work sometime soon to try it out. And uh, they seemed like a really nice couple. They were really, uh, they seemed like the kind of people you'd want to work for. <laughs> um, they're just, you know, they seemed really down to earth and kind and. I liked it a lot. I like the fact that they had a 15% discount for oh, all absolutely. of our Teamster uh, members. So they're in Redlands. Uh, make sure you look them up, get on the Teamster Advantage app and pull them up, Batter Rebellion uh, in Redlands. Yeah, and I think something that if you wouldn't ask, or if they didn't share it with you, you probably wouldn't know. But I think what stood out to me was that they opened during the pandemic um, and they weren't able to receive help, but how, some way, somehow, they, they survived. survived. They survived. And now they're opening that second restaurant out in Riverside. I mean, that's that's yeah. the power of small businesses, and obviously, in a sense, even the working people um, allowing them to help them out. Yeah, staying connected to to your local community, which is the whole purpose of this show. And so, uh, with that, uh, let me move into uh, Teamster Jobs. That's the the first one I'd like to talk about is Coca Cola. Uh, for those of you that like Coke and all the Coca Cola products. In Southern California, if you like to get a soda or a Diet Coke or a Sprite or uh, many of those things, those are Teamsters that are actually producing uh, that soda. Those are Teamsters that are uh, handling and managing that. And then there's a there's a, a third party distributor that actually delivers it, and they're also Teamsters uh, that work for what is Reyes Coca Cola, and they make the delivery. So if you're enjoying Coca Cola anywhere uh, in the Southwest. You know, uh, for the, actually in California for sure, you know that Teamsters made sure that it, that was, uh, you know, that got that healthy drink to you. Now remember, they have water too, by the way. Dasani water is a Coca-Cola product. And because, you know, the holidays are around the corner, I guess it's safe to say Santa is a Teamster because Santa is on the Coca-Cola bottle. So the rumor is, is that Santa was originally the color green, and then Coca-Cola adopted it and got Santa to be red. Uh, that's at least what Coca-Cola says. I don't know how true it was because I haven't been around that long uh, as far as, you know, that was over 100 years ago that it switched over. But uh, anyway, so Teamsters handle Coca-Cola. Um, the next one is uh, hotel employees. 
Uh, if you go to Las Vegas, uh, if you go to the Tropicana or you go to Hard Rock or uh, the Mirage or uh, Bally's, uh, uh, any of those, most of those hotels, actually the Bell and the, uh, the, those that handle your car, your valets, are all Teamsters for the most part. And they're, most of them are actually all union employees in the hotel themselves. Right. Hyatt Regency is a big one. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, next time you're in Vegas and you're, you've are you got somebody taking your car or uh, they're help, helping you with your luggage up to your room, it's it's very likely they're a Teamster, and it's pretty darn sure they're actually a union member, but most likely they're a Teamster, so make sure we thank a Teamster. Uh, the last uh, one I want to point out and, and remind everybody is Costco employees. Uh, not all Costco's are union, but a lot of them are. And if you go to a Costco, the high likelihood is is that a Teamster is helping you uh, at the register. A Teamster is welcoming you when you come in. A Teamster is uh, doing some of the work inside. Um, maybe a lot of people listening don't realize that. Uh, so make sure that you, uh, again, thank a Teamster. Right. Best way to identify um, whether a store is um, a Teamster or store or not is what I usually started doing. Um, usually don't tend to look at people's name tags. That's something of the past i think but recently i started doing that and if you look at their name tags they actually start um they have their teamster pens yeah, on there a lot of them have their teamster so pens on there that's one way to identify yeah them. and do that if you're a teamster or a union member and you see somebody wearing their teamster badges whether it's at costco or anywhere else you know thank them for wearing their wearing their button wearing their brand uh, especially if you're in a teamster or if you're at a costco that's got teamster members in it uh, make sure that you say hey thank you for putting that uh putting that button on or putting that pin on uh, and 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 wear in their pride uh, of their organization that obviously makes sure that they have good wages, hours, and working conditions. And so now we're going to move into news. Uh, we'll briefly move through news. I'm excited to get to our guest here in a few minutes. Uh, but before we get there, uh, I want to talk about DHL. Uh, DHL is went on strike on the seventh. Uh, they had been on a 12-day strike. They had organized. Uh, 1,100 DHL Express workers had organized in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky uh, International Airport, what's called CVG. And the, they had organized uh, earlier this year, and the employer was uh, playing a little bit of hardball. And as a result, uh, a picket line went up on December 7th, and picket lines were extended to dozen, actually, I think nearly 100 locations across the country, and uh, uh, thousands of workers walked off the job in solidarity with those workers in Cincinnati. And uh, many of us actually got to enjoy the picket line ourselves yes. uh, here the last few days. Um, a matter of fact, I was on one on Friday, and I had a, I had a grand old time. I don't, you were there, right? I was Remember? there, and, and let me tell you this. I've been to many picket lines, and I think so far this has been one of my favorites because I was actually able to witness Randy in action, and oh boy, I mean that was just that was a that was my early um, Christmas gift. Yeah, it was it was fun. I I, I introduced myself to a lot of their uh, security and other individuals there, and uh, we had lots of kind words, and uh, you know it was uh, it was a lot of fun, a lot of humor, and uh, I you know we just made a good time of it. Uh, you know, workers in solidarity walked off the job uh, to support. Uh, other workers thousands of miles away mm -hmm. and that is how the american middle class is built when Absolutely. workers stick together when workers come together they're on the same page and they help one another uh it was it was great to see the energy on that picket line it was great to see all those teamsters honor that picket line and hold in solidarity and that is why as a matter of fact today uh, a settlement was reached uh, a tentative agreement was nearly close a couple days ago. They pulled the line down because they were so close. But literally within the last few hours, a settlement was reached, and those workers uh, have a tentative agreement that is for recommendation and will go out. I don't know all the specifics of it because we, it just happened. Again, uh, great work. Uh, you know, More than 6,000 DHL workers across the country supported these 1,100 workers, and we got to do more of this across the country, and that's why we're seeing a lot of this activity. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next thing I want to uh, quickly talk about is 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 the prime healthcare labor disputes. We have uh, 1,800 frontline healthcare workers that are uh, on strike uh, at four prime healthcare facilities. It's a seven-day strike. Uh, the recent work stoppage, uh, you know, at prime healthcare facilities in the region are at the prime 
St. Francis Medical Center in Linwood, the Prime Centennial Medical Center in Inglewood, the Prime Encino Medical Center in Encino, and then the Prime Garden Grove Hospital in the medical center uh, that's in, located in Garden Grove. And so uh, clearly, you know, this is a very anti-union company. Uh, this, is a, this is a healthcare uh, industry that is, we've seen become corporatized, and it's unfortunate that there's not a priority to the workers that are some of the most important workers in America, making sure that, that health care is delivered on a very, uh, you know, safe and, right. and, and fair uh, foundation. Uh, with one another, and you know, we, we we have a tendency to overlook that from time to time. Do you want to add something, Ramaldo? Yes, I you know I think adding to that, it's um, a few years ago this specific um, company or organization, uh, their nurses were out on strike, and you know I think it's very inspiring to see them out there um, because as you drive out there, I mean, just imagine if you're heading to the ER and you just see all these nurses out there. It gives I think I might go to a different a ER, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Uh, a different ER, and then too, it gives a patient a different perspective, um, because yeah, these nurses or these um, hospital workers or employees are taken for granted, and and we we tend to never or barely appreciate these workers. Yeah, and picket lines run daily from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. Wednesday through Friday, uh, and so uh, you know support SEIU and make sure that we get out there and help out. Uh, the next uh, item I want to talk about is a five-year contract with Mirage and Hard Rock Resort. The deal affects over 1,700 Las Vegas hospitality workers, and it comes on the heels of the union's uh, previous recent agreements with MGM, Caesars, and Wynn. And so uh, the, the great thing is another 1,700 workers in Vegas have secured a really good contract uh, for the future. And... You know, Tropicana actually is covering over 300 hospitality workers, the rest of them uh, in the other locations. And uh, once again, uh, workers have won as a result of their collective, uh, you know, coming together and, and fighting together. Uh, just quickly like to go into some new labor laws that are going into effect. The, this is actually a reminder of Assembly Bill 701 were warehouse quotas. I, I, I specifically pulled this one out because uh, even though it went into effect in January 1st of 2022, uh, I actually was behind this uh, for many, many years about trying to make sure that warehouse workers had protections from quotas that violate labor laws. And uh, so for those of us that are in collective bargaining agreements, we obviously have language in our union contracts that that deal with quotas, that deal with production standards. And for those that are non-union, don't have anything. In other words, the, the employer could crank up production, can, uh, especially with today's technology and automation, can make things move at an extremely fast pace. And many times that actually violates labor laws. And so I worked with a number of legislators uh, for years prior to this uh, being passed. There was a couple that we propped up and moved through the legislature that didn't actually get there to the home stretch, but this one did. I'm pr particularly fond of it because uh, uh, coming out of a warehouse myself, being a representative and dealing with labor standards issues, making sure that those are always fair and reasonable for all parties, where I was able to help craft a bill that inserted a number of protections on a broader scale. Uh, so that m more workers weren't being taken advantage of unfair quotas and unsafe laws. Now, the enforcement part's going to be the difficult uh, aspect to it, uh, and those are there, that's where some challenges are being met, but it's good to have the first step where something like this uh, has, is actually moving in that direction, where, especially in this area. There are hundreds of thousands of jobs in the region in warehouses. There's hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of jobs in this industry, and we are many of us know that that these workers have been uh, exploited over the last few decades and their their labor standards and their quotas and their production standards uh, are at complete control of the employer if they're non-union again if they're union guess what we have the right to bargain all that we have a right to make sure that those standards are fair and we have a right to grieve them if we think that they're out of whack and so that brings us that's our news what i'm going to do is actually take an early break uh, so that we can uh, go to uh, you know what I did is I, I, I messed up here. You know, I'm a long-time organizer, first-time radio show host. I was supposed to say that at the beginning. How come you guys didn't correct me? 
no, man, I missed it. If I was a ha- if I had the hang of it, I would have I wouldn't have missed that. And so uh, we also want to remind you to call in uh, 888-909-1050 or 909-792-5222. Please call in if you're listening in. We would love to hear from you out there. Uh, we're going to go to a break. You're hearing the Worker Power Hour. See you on the other side of the break. KCAA 1050 AM and Express 106.5 FM. Located in the heart of San Bernardino, California, the Teamsters Local 1932 Training Center is designed to train workers for high demand, good paying jobs in various industries throughout the Inland Empire. If you want a pathway to a high-paying job and the respect that comes with a union contract, visit 1932trainingcenter.org to enroll today. That's 1932trainingcenter.org. Are you underpaid and overworked? Is a living wage and employee benefits like affordable health care more of a dream than a reality for you and your family? If so, it's time to form a union. Don't be denied the wages and benefits you deserve. Come together in a union with the power of numbers. A union is not a privilege. It's your right, and it will make a difference. Contact Teamsters Local 1932, a powerful and successful labor union in San Bernardino, by visiting Teamsters1932.org backslash organize to start today. One of the best ways to build a healthier local economy is by shopping locally. Teamster Advantage is a shop local program started by Teamster Local 1932 that has brought together hundreds of locally owned businesses to provide discounts for residents who make shopping locally their priority. Everything from restaurants like Corky's to fun times at SB Raceway and much, much more. If you're not currently a Teamster and you want access to these local business discounts, contact Jennifer at 909-889-8377, extension 224. Give her a call. That number again is 909-889-8377, extension 224. You are listening to KCAA 1050 AM and 106.5 FM. It's the Worker Power Hour. So I may have seemed nervous on the other side of the break because I've had, I have my mentor sitting next to me. He's, he's uh, been this incredible person uh, for most of my adult life, almost my entire adult life. And so I get to have him on this, this cool radio show. And I get to talk about uh, some cool stuff uh, with him Uh, You've got, uh, his name is Randy Kamek. Uh, He is the principal officer of Teamsters Local 63 in Rialto. It's one of the largest locals in the entire country. Uh, He's also a former joint council president, which is the president of a regional body uh, for more than 20 local unions in Southern California, Nevada, uh, Hawaii, Guam, and Saipan. He also was a international vice president uh, f- for the International Brothers of Teamsters for nearly 20 years, uh, almost 20 years, I think it was 18 or 19 years. And he is, in our organization, considered one of the most respected individuals. And I think most importantly, uh, his achievements have not only been recognized by countless elected officials, uh, he's actually got hundreds of awards from elected officials recognizing his contribution to the community on a regular basis, is that over his more than 40 year career in a leadership role, he has just negotiated some of the best working conditions, some of the best contracts for working people so that they can have better health care so they can have a good retirement vehicle and make sure that 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 their family and their future is secure. And it's somebody that I learned from uh, for, again, you know, more than 20 years, uh, I still learn from every single day. When I get in a challenge or I get in a pickle, I pick up the phone and give him a call and he helps me through it. And uh, he's just a pillar of the labor community in the Inland Empire. And he has done so much for hundreds of thousands of workers in the IE and uh, quite frankly, across 
millions of workers across the country, and we're very, very happy to have them on here today. Randy Kamek, thank you for being on our show today. Well, th th thank you, Randy, for inviting me. It's an honor for me to be here. I'm quite humbled by the invitation. Uh, I've been listening to your show the last few uh, the last few weeks, and I really appreciate the the effort of reaching out to the general public and kind of educating them about what the labor movement is about, what the Teamsters are about particularly, and and to our existing members who sometimes in the hustle bustle don't get very well educated about what we do on a broader scale. Um, I, some of the things that I've, I've heard you talk about with the outreach to the community. You know, I started my career 56 years ago as a Teamster, and I've watched how things evolved from that 56 years. Of course, before that, you know, I came back from, I got out of the service in the mid-60s, right at the, came back from Vietnam and Libya. And, uh, you know, I was kind of perplexed about the direction I wanted to go into. And I was offered a job at United Parcel Service in downtown Los Angeles. And I've been for the last 56 years. I've uh, never missed a beat about how much I love this organization. I love the opportunity to help people, help members, help their families. You know, you're not always successful, but when you are, it's as a special personal feeling to me. And to see not just what I do, but to see what the organization does collectively to help people. Because that's really what the labor movement is all about, you know, bringing people together. That's what's so great about this show. It's reaching out. And Local 1932, and Randy, I thank you for the very kind remarks. And, uh, but 1932, here in San Bernardino, has opened the door to um, a whole new horizon in involving the community, involving the Chamber of Commerce, local businesses. Um, some 50 years ago, the biggest, and for quite some period of time, the biggest opposition to the labor movement was the National Chamber of Commerce. That's correct, yeah. They're biggest uh, contributors to the National Right to Work Association which tries to beat down anybody who tries to represent workers and make their lives better, or their families' lives better. Can you uh, believe that we're on 26 chambers and we're actually on the board of directors for three of them? Isn't that, isn't that incredible? That, that's unheard of because at one time <clears throat> the Chamber of Commerce would have nothing to do with us. You know, in the past we've made efforts way, way back to try to educate them that we're not the bad guys that some of the employers were trying to convince people and they've championed in the employer's cause but here locally that transition to the thinking with the fact like Randy just said that they actually are members and some of his staff is actually the president of some of the chambers here locally uh, so that's an amazing turnaround to have the community the local businesses and the local chamber of commerce beginning to understand that working together is better for them, it's better for us, it's better for the community because local businesses do more through their local taxes to support your local fire departments, um, the police department, many of your civic um, things that are offered to the community come from the tax yeah, base social and, services and local yep. businesses yep. and so by getting our members and getting the public to support local business is good for the community i think that's where the chambers have started to realize that there's a whole new opportunity for them and an opportunity to us to get past that that barrier we've had over the years with the chamber. Yeah, it's our members that spend the most money in the community because our members make more money than everybody else does as far as working people is concerned. And those small businesses and those chambers are recognizing that connection. So this is what's cool about this show is, is you know, I've worked for him for so many years, I actually get to cut him off now versus him cutting me off. <laughs> It's regularly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, so what I brought you onto the show for is, I, 
you know, on top of that, what you just laid out, but I also would like for you to point out, you know, uh, obviously you're, you've served a very long career and you've been involved in the labor movement in one way or another for a very long period of time. And you were part of an era where strikes, kind of like you're starting to see now, there were more strike, there's a lot more strike activity and workers kind of taking control and taking direct, ac direct action. Early in your career, there was a lot of that too. And, and there was this camaraderie with the community. There was this camaraderie in assistance, natural assistance, where uh, everybody kind of worked together in the middle class, recognizing they got to help each other. What's your perspective on what labor disputes were like back then? We can't talk about the things we got away with, though, right? Um, but uh, and, and what you see today with this resurgence in, you know, you were on the picket line Sunday night, and you, you got to walk with some of those very people you're talking about right now. And how does that compare to back in the day? And are, are we kind of pulling this back together, Randy, from your perspective? Well, yeah, yeah, it's encouraging to go out um, as the other night and to see uh, workers and people from the community, from other Teamster jobs coming out and volunteering their time to support other workers. Um, going way back when I started, when there was a strike, you could expect to go to jail. I mean, the, the police were very uneducated about what we do and what we're trying to do. And uh, it was, you, somebody had to go to jail. It was today. The over, Pinkertons. <laughs> yeah, for and, history. And quite often, I've been arrested probably 50 times because they'd always come out, who's in charge? And somebody, some idiot would say him. And, uh, you know, they never prosecuted us, but they'd take and drive us around town and try to keep us from going back to the picket line. Um, and there was, there was sometimes violence. When cops come out and try to get all rough and tough, and that's not what we're looking for. You know, we're looking to try to convince the employer that he's better off with the workers inside than outside. And, uh, but if you see that transition into what you see today is the other night, uh, the police came out. We've learned to work with the police as much as possible. Most police um, departments have labor details now who are specifically educated about what we're trying to do. So they don't come out thinking that we're a bunch of criminals and a bunch of mafiosos, and that's the characterization in the, the media for many Yeah, the movies and the media and all yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, and that's just not true. It's just not true. There's isolated cases in corporate structure. I mean, look what's going on today. Just watch any, any of the news channel about somebody exposing somebody for some sign of corruption. You know, we've had our bad guys, but the theme and the compassion and the leadership of the Teamsters and many other unions is there to help workers, help their families, make their lives better. That's basically what we do in very, very simple terms. And I think by watching now, there's a greater understanding today, even with the media, you still have some very prejudiced folks out there that uh, would rather see us go away and they'll work night and day to try to do that. But you know, we kick the grass whenever we can, if I can say that uh, kind of vividly, but... Um, I think Frank just beeped you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so I see we've got actually a caller on. We've got somebody in wanting to talk to you, Randy, believe it or not. We've got a caller on the phone. we got someone on the phone. Let's pipe them in, if you don't mind. <laughs> unless, unless it's my ex-wife, and I prefer to take that privately. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. We'll cut her off if she's on. <laughs> Who, uh, this is Randy Corgan and Randy Kamek here. You're live on the phone. Uh, who, who do I'm, we have? I'm definitely not his ex-wife, that's for sure. <laughs> I recognize that voice. Uh, yeah, you know, thank you for taking my call. You know, I just wanted to uh, share my uh Can you introduce my yourself? Experience. Oh, my name is Miguel Lopez. I am the treasurer of the Southern California Teamster Retiree Association. That Randy Kamek was very much uh, in, in support of building and uh, and making happen because you're once a teamster, you're always a teamster, <clears throat> and you can always play a role in helping our organization. Uh, it's kind of hard for me right now to even ask a question because uh, Randy just brother Kamek just laid out like the whole scenario of what we do and how we do it, and it was really uh, nice. But 
I would like to just uh, make one, a couple of questions, and then I'll get off the line. Let Randy do what he does. Um, I've been in the in the Teamsters uh, over 50 years. I've been retired for 15. Um, it's a great uh, a great life being a retiree of the Teamsters. A great pension program. Uh, I, I was a local freight driver. Um, so I want to take Randy. He came back, back some years. Uh, three important dates that maybe he could make a short comment on. 1970, there was a wildcat strike to fight for sick leave. Uh, and it was pretty much triggered by Local 208, which was the grandfather local in the West Coast, uh, founded in 1904. Um, and uh, it was a very trying time. And, and Brother k shared with me la- last week when I was uh, at a meeting with him about a couple of things guys did to help support each other when they went to jail. I'd like him to tell a short story about that. <laughs> also, uh, in 1979, uh, Jimmy Carter was coming out of the presidency and we had a very difficult time when deregulation was put into place, uh, which eventually led, I think, to, for the Teamsters to endorse Ronald Reagan. Um, and then the other thing that I think, I, I don't know if there'll be time for this, but in 1980 was a real trying time for our union where our national leadership was taking in, um, in, a, uh, in a very difficult uh process with the federal government and um we were fighting to save the employee status of many truck drivers uh where they made them um independent contractors they call them and uh, it's really caused a lot of problems for workers to join unions so with that being said i want to thank randy kamek for being a leader i've known him for many years uh i was in local 63 for a while also um, always appreciated his, uh, his straightforward way of leading, his honesty, and his uh, ability to talk to anybody from the new worker to the old dog retiree like myself. And uh, I want to say I appreciate you, Brother K. Mack, and you know, if you could address a couple of those things that I talked about, it would be great. And before he does, I just want to say thank you, Miguel, for calling in. You obviously, uh, I, it's great to hear from you. It's great to see the work that you're still continuing to do. And, uh, you know, for me, it's cyclical to be sitting here hosting a show where somebody that I was on the floor with as a member, you, uh, you know, getting out there organizing, doing a lot of things that we did when I was, uh, you know, many, many decades ago, right? And then, mm-hmm. you know, for us to recognize, obviously, Camex's contribution in that and in, in always being steadfast in his leadership uh, to make it happen. So I'm really excited to hear some of the stories he's got to say about uh, the those three dates in which he just pointed out. He, and Randy's chomping at the bit to talk about them. I can see that. <laughs> Go for uh, it. <laughs> well, I'm glad you weren't my ex-wife, Miguel, but I, <laughs> I, I appreciate the very kind remarks. Uh, uh, you know, it was a different culture back. You mentioned the Wildcat strike in 1970 and uh, from Local 208, and you're right, it was the moving local union. And... Uh, there was a different culture back then, particularly in the freight industry and the Teamsters. Um, members were very close, their families, even to this day, many of the people that came out of that era and out of the Wildcat still get together regularly. You know, the retirees and, you know, from Montebello and Long Beach and uh, old members of, I shouldn't say old, but, you know, retired members from 208 and were part of the Wildcat. But the incident you were talking about was, and it wasn't just one, but there was uh, one of the one of the strikers was arrested for allegedly something. Allegedly doing something, right. and the person that that they arrested um, had a family, had a couple of kids, and there was a single guy there, another worker who said, rather than him go to jail, because they were going to put him in jail, I did it. I don't want to see my brother go to jail and have his family left out and his kids not being able to get by. So he took the fall. He said, I did it. He ended up going to jail, prison actually, for a year or so. And to help help a brother, that was the kind of thing you could see. It wasn't uncommon to see that kind of closeness 
You know, and over the years with technology and social media, people kind of drifted away from that kind of very close uh, relationship with each other. But I think that what's going on here today with the radio program and reaching out um, to people and educating them, try to bring them together, have a greater understanding of what we do. It's called for the greater good. That's the premise that we operate on the greater good. We don't always make every single person happy, but the greater good is what it's about. And, uh, you know, we were disappointed when Jimmy Carter, um, who we helped elect, um, deregulated the trucking industry and destroyed many good at one time hundreds of thousands of jobs have been destroyed as a result of deregulation uh, in o- the trucking over industry. a period of time at one yeah. time there was over two hundred and fifty thousand uh, teamster members alone just in the freight industry today there's maybe thirty thousand if that um you just have abf and a couple of small companies around the and so we were disappointed in that we've seen some you know, tragedies, you know, and then you mentioned 1980, or a little before 1980, when some of our leadership got a little too close with the mob, and rather than take responsibility for their own actions, their misassociations, uh, they sold us out in what's called a consent decree, and greed, and we're still under it today, 40 years later, 30 some years later, um, that we're going to get out of it because I think we're beginning to see um, a different kind of leadership, not only in our union, but in the legislature, people to understand, you know, we can't keep these guys under wraps. They're out there trying to help people. What's wrong with that? You know, they weeded out the bad guys some 20, 30 years ago, and now it's jaywalking and, and crap like that. And uh, not that they haven't done some good. Because people that are gone shouldn't be here. Well, and even in that, even in that light, Randy, um, you know, the majority wasn't bad. It was just a handful that make everybody else look bad too. And the reality is, is you know, as we went through our bumps and you know our our ups and downs as an organization, that you know, no matter what, our members continue to be resilient and 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 move forward in continuing to organize and build capacity and and make sure that union contracts were enforced because th- those are the things that transcend time. Those, making sure that workers that started in 1970 or 75 or eight or you know in the early 80s, they ultimately get to retirement. Many of them you know, went from company to company to company and different, uh, all in the same plan because they were a Teamster. And as a result of having that great infrastructure, these individuals were able to ultimately get to a good retirement age, like Miguel himself. He worked for many companies over the years. I don't think he's still on the line. But, uh, you know, thank you for pointing those things out. I think it's really an important discussion. Let's back up to, to deregulation. 1979, you know, uh, clearly the Carter, uh, the Kennedys, uh, who were really uh, a rock in the shoe of the Teamsters for many years, and the the Carter administration teamed up to ultimately kind of break down what was called uh, trucking regulation and they went too far and as a result of going too far with deregulating the industry they essentially killed the industry saying that competitiveness uh, creating a, a more competitive marketplace would make it better for everybody well the only the only people it made it better for was big corporations am, am i right randy i mean you got to see that change from 1979 to today yeah it's it's it was a real kicking our butt to see over a period of time many of these major companies that had been around for 100 years, Consolidated Freightways, a 100-year-old company, and it was the largest trucking company in the world. But deregulation um, slowly but surely, Willig, Ryder, PIE, you can go on and on. Some of you probably never heard of some of these companies, but they were age-old companies that people had worked at. They're their father had worked out, their grandfather had worked out, and they're gone. Most recently, Yellow Freight, another victim of deregulation down the road, where 33,000 people lost their jobs. At some point, you know, we got to look back and you kind of learn from the past. You know, something that appears to be good for, for an employer. Look at the 
the foreseeable consequences of what you're doing. Nobody did that. And what they did, they made competition a little better, but at what cost? The cost of hundreds of thousands of people and their families were adversely affected because they lost their job. And so let's shift gears with that. Now we, we come all these years later, corporations have had their way the last few decades. Obviously, we live in the Inland Empire, and we've seen that you know they've built you know thousands of warehouse operations and uh, gotten away with having temporary agencies, you know, contingent workforce, high turnover, and in the end, they just you know don't play, pay their employees good enough. And now, uh, as you as you were on Sunday on the picket line Sunday, uh, you know, walking the picket line with with these courageous workers at Amazon, walking the picket line at DHL, uh, you know, and and you know. Uh, you know, five decades later, Randy is still walking the picket line, right? All of us that are part of this movement recognize the relationship between everybody. Um, no, you're not in a walker. <laughs> For those of you that can't see us, <laughs> right? Uh, but, you know, it's culminating back into a space where workers are realizing corporations got too greedy. They, they overreached. These big corporations are not paying their fair share. They, they've, they've made it to where retiree medical or a good medical, affordable medical or retirement plans themselves label them as outdated. Um, and now you see a workforce that's struggling uh, to get by because corporate America's profits are at an all-time high and they've made you know immense amount of money for CEOs and everybody at the top, but workers are struggling. And then we're seeing workers actually take charge. We're seeing them take direct action. And, and so the pendulum's swinging back and forth. Statistically, uh, more than 70% of, of people support unions today. And actually, ironically, uh, over 80%, if you're under 25, support forming unions. And it's just a matter of accessing that process. We'll talk about that on later shows. Uh, but let's bridge this gap from back then in you know, 1970 in the Wildcat strike, because those, those individuals during the Wildcat strike, when I started in the late 80s and early 90s, and I worked as a casual and bounced around in, in that time period. Ironically, it was those that were a part of that wildcat strike from 1970. And Miguel, I think, touched on it that they went on the street over sick pay. There was a fight over sick pay. Uh, they walked off the job. Uh, it was a knockdown drag out for a while. And they were able to gain uh, something as a result of that labor dispute that carried on uh, across the entire country. And, and so, it's important for us to reflect on the fact that it's like that age is coming back where workers are realizing we've got to take control. No one's going to do it for us because corporate America's had their way about them. What are you seeing today, Randy, that, that, that relates to what you saw back then? A again, my point is those individuals, yourself, Bob, Molina, uh, for those of you that are listening that remember him, and, and uh, Ed Willis, um, maybe that's a blast of the past for you, Randy. Those, those individuals were on the docks and at the end of their career, as I was beginning my career, and were sharing these stories of, of what they did, the camaraderie they had, and how they tried to take care of each other, even in difficult circumstances, or you know, as, as you pointed out, when people make mistakes, uh, we, there's, it's a family uh, to, in the middle class. We have to approach with the community, with workers, and with unions, with labor as a whole, in this holistic approach. Are you seeing a resurgence of that today, uh, like what you experienced on Sunday? I, I think that, that here recently, and most, most recently, with the potential strike at UPS where we have 350,000 Teamster members who work there, um, there was a very good possibility of a strike and there hadn't been one here, and there hadn't been a national strike since 1997, and a local strike we had 1970, 73, 74. But as that was looming, you begin to see people starting to come together again, and you saw that with this DHL, where people were coming out to picket lines that has nothing to do directly with them, but they're beginning to understand that all these things are related standing up against employers who should elect to be the bad guys, and some of them are not. And it's not a fair characterization that all employers are bad. Some do the right thing, and, you know, they, they're resistant to cost 
the fact even those, you know, being, you know, what they do, they've got the bottom line to protect. But beginning to see people come back together in another, um, in this new dimension, as, as people begin to understand the broader perspective of what we do, and it's not just worker rights, it's civil rights, those things have always gone hand in hand. Not everybody f realizes that, but part of what we do is to, you know, everybody gets paid the same. You know, there's no discrimination in, in terms of a union contract. We've done away with that, where the white guy gets something, the Hispanic or black gets something else because of their color. Or woman. Or, yep. their, or their sexual orientation. Yep. You know, that that's something that people, we've done great strides and the Teamsters Union and labor in general to pass legislation, to encourage legislators to take the steps necessary. Because part of what we do as an organization isn't just negotiating a contract or enforcing it. It's also working on the political side to get legislation passed. That yeah, getting good work. policy, getting good policy passed, right? Yeah. Because another thing that's, that's, I think, important to say is that what we do for the people that we represent has a direct effect on people who work in similar jobs that are non-union may never become union. We raise the standard of living so employers that, that have a group that we haven't organized will pay up. They don't really want to, but they see that the contracts we have are at a much higher rate so they raise the in, in, increase the wages here. We help people uh, throughout this country without even knowing it because we've raised the standard. Every time we get increases for our folks, take Costco that was brought up earlier. Not all of the Costco's are union. But, but they all time, get union wages. <laughs> but they all get union wages because they don't want them all to become, so they pay them exactly what our folks get. So every time our folks, we negotiate a good contract. Uh, the thing we did here recently with the national contract of a Costco was we got them into the Teamster pension, which is the, the thing that people fight for. We, you know, been a trustee on that for like 20 years. We have $55 billion, and we're giving pensions to folks uh, that you wouldn't believe. And, uh, but that's, that's kind of as organizationally how we affect people's lives beyond those that are just wearing the colors and paying dues. We help people we don't even know we've helped because we've raised their standard of living. Yeah, and, and obviously the basis for this radio show is to get the message out, is to, is to do better public relations and get the community to understand, you know, we're not uh, we're not we're not what we're been judged by by corporate America standard on just these, you know, uh, these these situations of negativity or these things that a few people have done bad over the years. You know, every we've been around over a hundred years. People have obviously made some mistakes. At the end of the day, for the last hundred years, the consistent place to protect workers has been the labor movement and only the labor movement, no other institution, no other organization. And as these workers are on strike right now, like they were uh, last week and, and obviously the last few days uh, here, here locally, and we're walking the picket line with them, those workers that are, that are walking the picket line or walking off the job, they're fighting, as Randy, you're pointing out, they're fighting for what others are going to gain further down the road. The sacrifice that they're making today it's how, it's how everybody gained the eight-hour workday. It's how everybody gained some sa safety on the job. It's how everybody gains what they think are these, these uh, just natural protections at work. They were gained by workers walking off the job and fighting for it. Like in 1970, fighting for sick pay. Those workers walked off the job, gotten a knockdown drag out with, with the employer over sick pay. And now sick pay is a standard. In other words, it's something that, that everybody uh, typically gets, at least in the state of California, it's actually a mandate that all employers have to require sick pay. Now, whether we've changed the overtime law, uh, it, you probably remember, Randy, actually I know you remember because I, I, we, we were together at that rally in 19, I think it was 1994, it was either 93 or 94 when Pete Wilson had repealed the overtime rule in California. and. 
that meant that workers in California no longer got it after eight. As a matter of fact, Randy and I were together with obviously the staff and all kinds of activists within the union. And Pete Will, uh, Pete Wilson, in, in, had had supported the in, the IWC, which is the Internal Welfare Commission, to repeal the eight-hour workday and make it a forty-hour work week. And so that changed the structure of how overtime was paid. Well. Clearly, we got to work. We elected another, a different governor just a couple years later and got that overtime law flipped back uh, under Gray Davis. And yeah, Gray Davis ultimately ended up being recalled. It's kind of a shame for how much work he did for working people. Uh, but what happened was unions, unions and activists in the labor movement got out, knocked on doors, and forced for that overtime, instead of it being after 40 in California, to be moved back to after eight in California. And those are the types of things you're talking about, Randy, right? Those are the things that, that, that the general public is bending from, benefiting from every day. And we've got four minutes, so we're going to have to wrap up here pretty soon. But what are your thoughts on that, Randy? You, do you remember that rally in, in L.A. when we were at that? Yeah, I sure do. We didn't get arrested that day. but We did not. <laughs> you know, I think Randy touches on a very important subject is that a lot of the things that affect working people are caused or solved by being active on the political side. We ask our members to belong to a voluntary um, program where they kick in anywhere from a dollar to ten dollars a week to help us support politicians. And I'm not, and it's called a Democrat, Republican, Independent Voter Education. It, and it's a thing where we try not to be totally one-sided when it comes to the political scene. But we try to support and encourage people to run for office who are good for working people. Regardless of their party affiliation. If they're a Republican, and we support right. some Republicans because they've been good. We just we just worked a bill here in Sacramento, and I was the chairman of the California Public Teamsters Public Affairs. And... Uh, over autonomous vehicles in California, we're talking about tractor-trailer autonomous vehicle, very dangerous situation. A bill that was sponsored and passed through all the legislatures um, with support from the Democrats and the Republicans, um, probably the first time you've had a, almost a unanimous bill. That's of course, right. it, was, it was vetoed by our 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 present governor, and uh, we're not going to forget about that. But. We sure aren't. we got two minutes. We've got to wrap the show up. So uh, very good point. Uh, you know, uh, our, our organization, as well as a lot of labor unions, support. We, the political side, we get demonized as only doing this or only doing that. The reality is is we got to get back to supporting candidates that support working people, period. A lot of them talk a good game, but they don't necessarily deliver when it comes to it. That's a, We can actually do an entire show in the future, and we're going to get to that uh, as we get there. But I want to take this time as we wrap up to thank Randy for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate him being here. As you guys have heard me say early on, uh, he's been a tremendous role model to me. Uh, he's a, a, an incredible uh, wealth of information for not just me, but many, many labor uh, leaders across the country, and we appreciate him taking time out of his schedule and coming in here and, and saying uh, hi to everybody. So I don't know if you want to just say goodbye before we wrap up the last minute uh, so that I can do my final closing, Randy. Well, thank you, Randy, for the invitation. I would encourage you to keep doing this. The more you educate the public and existing members, I think it's a great thing. You know, I've been a teamster 56 years. My grandfather was a teamster in the 30s, 40s. My dad was. And I'm proud to have been one and still proud to this day. Things like this make me even more proud to see young folks like yourself reaching out and doing things that will help future workers. So thank you very much, Randy. Well, Keep thank you, the Randy. Good work. So we'll close our show. Uh, this is Randy Corgan here, longtime organizer, first time radio host. Uh, we always close our show with making sure that we ask, what can you do to help build worker power? Talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, and talk to your family. This is the Worker Power Hour, KCAA, 1050 AM, 106.5 FM. Thank you all for listening. KCAA Loma Linda.
The Legacy KCAA 1050 AM and Express 106.5 FM. NBC News Radio, I'm Lisa Taylor. Former President Trump is criticizing the Colorado Supreme Court's decision to ban him from the state's 2024 presidential ballot. Michael Kastner reports. Colorado Supreme Court said on Tuesday he violated the 14th Amendment's insurrectionist ban on January 6, 2021, when he encouraged the violent demonstrations at the U.S. Capitol. Most of God's